let's uh, uh, start today's lecture. We'll have Joel Merker talking about uh, symmetries with uh, power series, please. Okay, so I'm happy to be able to present some recent results. And also I would like to express my thanks to the Greek uh, program because I was like lucky to discuss uh, with uh, Pavel Nerovsky who is not here today, but maybe it's because he knows everything. And then I will speak about like uh, elementary uh, things, a bit of affine geometry. And I, I, I scheduled to speak about um, exceptional CR manifolds. I tried to, to do it today. So now I start with something very elementary, which is a quartic, a quad, quadric, sorry, in uh, C2. So Z is X plus I, Y, U plus IV is W. And therefore I'm looking just a, at a paraboloid, U equal Z, Z bar. So U is really part of W. So I try somehow to represent a general hypersurface in C2. And this is a true picture on the right. Okay, so this is very elementary, but I will say first, because I was asked to, to do something a bit elementary. And then I'm looking at the affine counterpart of this uh, object in C2. So here first, I'm working in C2, and I want to look at the same object in R3. So this means that everything now X and Y are real, and U and also, which is this picture, in fact. This is this picture. This is exactly this, okay? And I'm looking at a very elementary thing, which is affine group, the full affine group, not the special affine group, because the special affine group would be that this determinant is equal to one. So I don't do that. So you have 12 constants here. And this part, this part is invertible matrix in GL3 of R. So there is a famous theorem by Dubrov, Komarakov, Rabinovich, which was redone by Eastwood and Ejov which classifies the locally homogeneous surfaces in three-dimensional affine space, which is either a degenerate, so cylinder is a degenerate situation, which means that it is a product. What it means, you take a curve in R2, okay? And you make a product with R this way. So it's times R, okay? So the curve times R, which is a cylinder, which is a degenerate case because it amounts to classification of curves, essentially. Modulo slight, slight adaptations. So there is a complete list. Okay, so I don't comment much on it. So it's like not trivial. And it's only in the 90s that the list was complete because there, were, there was a work by Abdallah and Vranken about the class of surfaces whose peak invariant vanishes identically. So it was like delicate class. And once this delicate class was done, there could exist a complete classification. Okay. So now, before I go further, I would like to mention some classification problems. Okay. The first one I would like to mention is open as far as I know. It is about surfaces in R4 or C4, if you prefer first. Even in C4, as far as I know, there is no paper which classifies such surfaces in C4 completely. And I would like to say that when you take S2 times I R4, this contained in uh, No, 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 maybe I, I, uh, I'm making a mistake. Yes, so anyway, maybe I would like, don't want to insist on that. Maybe I will do it informally, okay? So in Vitushkin school, there is an old problem, which is 40 years old problem, is to somehow understand geometric models, homogeneous models of six dimensional CR manifolds in C4. So this means that the CR dimension 
is equal to two. And the co-dimension also is equal to two. And there are three uh, classes, elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic. And there is a paper in 99 by Isaiev, Ejof, and Schmalz, who propose to have a structure on it. And this uh, problem is not completely solved in the sense that it's only an e structure or in the top or, or, or even a carton connection. Maybe I'm not sure they, they've done a carton connection in this paper for all branches, but the classification of homogeneous models is not done there. And I want to say that all homogeneous models, affine homogeneous models that you can get from heat, you tubify it. I will speak about it in a more general context later. And you get for free some homogeneous models of such CR manifolds with like complexity about whether the group is the same or not. So I don't want to come on too much more than that on, on that problem because I consider it to be relatively hard. Also, the, the hypersurfaces in R4 for the non degenerate case. So it means that the Hessian is of rank three. The Asian is of rank three. So it was done by Verman in his PhD in 2001. And it's unpublished, it's 230 pages long. And there is, and it's for special affine. It's not for full affine, it's for special affine. And it's not trivial, it's really not trivial. And it was also done in a different way by Mike Eastwood and Vladimir Ejo. So these are rather advanced uh, classifications, but I would like to mention another problem, which is linked to what uh, Igor Zelenko and uh, Curtis Porter and David Zykes have done in the recent years. It's classification of three-dimensional hypersurface in R4, or if you prefer first in C4, to benefit of uh, the good properties of complex numbers, which are degenerate, which means instead of having a Hessian of rank three, they have a Hessian of rank less than, than three, which is either two or one, because if it is of rank zero, it's just u equals zero, because it just, you show that it is flat after an affine transformation, just horizontal. So this is very accessible. So I essentially don't need, uh, so, okay. And I want to say also that this case of surfaces in R4, last year I did teach some master two lecture in Orsay and I essentially done 80% of it. And the 20% which remain, so I get like about 30, already 30 families in equivalent. In equivalent. And I use Grodner basis to do this. So maybe in the second lecture, I will speak about about it a bit, okay? And the 20% which remain, as for, the problem is that it's difficult to find a transversal. I don't know because I have vector thin in, in R3 and it has some phase, phase diagram, which I do not really understand and which is necessary to understand to find normal forms. Anyway, so this is just to be, 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 be before I start anything and mention some open problems. So now I start again with something extremely elementary. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to this very uh, simple quadric. So I'm speaking to non-experts. So experts should forgive me to do something so trivial. So the affine infinitesimal vector field has again 12 free constants because the Lie algebra is also of dimension 12. So these are this constant A, B, C up to S. And it is well known, it goes back to Lee, that the flow exponential TL applied to a point of R3, which is of three coordinates X, Y, U, stabilizes this surface. In, in fact, any surface, which is graphed as U equal F of X, Y, if and only if the vector field L is tangent on restriction to the surface, it's tangent. But it's important to say that the vector field is extrinsic because it's defined over R3. 
it is really defined over R3, okay? It's not just defined intrinsically. So now what I want to do now is to examine this, what I call ek L, which is an equation for the vector field L. So what do I mean? I mean that I apply the derivation L to minus U plus X square plus Y square, and I restrict to the, so to the, to the quadric U equal X square plus Y square, and I examine these equations. So what do I do? I assign weight X one, Y one, do two, Y, because when you multiply by lambda X, there is lambda square, you see lambda square here, and hence lambda square over u, okay? So this is why you assign weights. And when I will speak about exceptional CR manifolds, it will be the same. So now I expand the ek L in power series of X and Y, no U, no U at all, because I replaced U already. And I organized, I organized the, the, what I obtain weight by weight. So this means, that I assume that I plus G is equal to mu, and I make the sum for mu equals zero to infinity with increasing weight. And what does it give it to me? It gives to me something elementary. So zero identically equal to, as I said, a polynomial, sorry, as I said, a polynomial in X and Y, okay? Even a Taylor series, okay? So this is, what I, what I said, no problem. And the coefficients are linear in the coefficients of the vector field, A to S. Just, it's just elementary to convince oneself that it is true. And then in this specific case, which is the most elementary essentially, so I repeat, it's just this very simple quadric. There are no monomials of order more than three. So it's just a polynomial, what I get, and it should be identically zero. And so this means that all coefficients of the monomials, okay, should vanish. And therefore I obtain a linear system, okay, which is this, so S becomes here, and 2M, uh, it is here essentially, here, sorry, okay. So I have how many equations? I have I think uh, eight equations essentially because I don't repeat the last one because it's two M twice and I just solve the system. So now it's very easy, okay? It's a system with 12 unknown and nine uh, equi or eight equations. And it's very easy to solve it on a computer. And we realize that by some choice, you have A, B, D, N as three constants, okay? And then you get four generators and the isotropy subalgebra is just this vector fields which vanish at zero. And then you get the least structure. I could change basis, but I did not, did not here. At some places you have to change basis. And now, before I go further, I make some anticipation, okay? Because this means me, seems to be too elementary, of course it is. And then I open another file. Okay. So please open, open, open. Okay. It seems that I have something here. Okay. So this is what I've done with Pavel recently. I, 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 I could also open the mapper file if you like. So it's, a, it's rather a similar story, but with uh, much more complexity, just to say that I'm not doing only trivial things. So I will explain it more later. So once again, you take, you, you see there is a vector field, which I call L on Maple. This is a PDF from Maple and you have some coefficients. So I had to make this file work to get some formula that I will show at the end of this talk or maybe next talk, I don't know whether I will have enough time. So this is a program, program for this vector field. It's like, it takes time to write it down correctly without mistakes, okay? 
And I really had to do this for such number of variables and such number of equations uh, until I was able to guess the general formulas. I will commit to it later, but now look, the linear system, it takes place in C complex number power 130, I repeat. So the computations take place in C power 130. So I have a similar linear system with that number of unknowns, this coefficient A, B, C to S, I showed already. So it's like six, 60,000 unknowns. And that number of equations, okay? So after some struggle with Maple and like improve the way of telling Maple, please do it, please do it. So in this case, it's just one half. So when I, what I expect here is to get 80 vector fields, but I split the vector field in two groups of 40. And this is the first group, or in, in fact, the second group of 40 vector fields. And I show them to you. So first, this is a vector field in C power 130. After I put all three, three parameters equal to zero. And there, here they are. Okay. These are the 40 vector fields that I get from a linear system. Okay. And then from this data, I had to like devise the general formulas, which I will speak about it later. Okay. So I stop about this. And I go back to something elementary. Now I, I, I am still about affine geometry, not yet Cauchy Riemann geometry. I, and now I raise the dimension and I take hypersurface now in C4. I take C4, but the same result is true over R. So it will, the same result also without using uh, the fact that C is algebraically closed. So the question or the problem I, I, I had like one year and a half ago in my head is to find homogeneous model, uh, finally, with the affine group, uh, finally homogeneous models of hypersurface H3 in C4 with Asian rank one. It, it is just one problem which was not touched by Verman or Eastwood and Langeoff, and it's much simpler, in fact. It's not so complicated. So let us go it, go to it, describe a bit the result. It is not an archive yet. So I take a surface, a hypersurface, u equal f of x, y, z, and it has an Asian matrix. So the Asian matrix, if you change a fine coordinate, you can verify that the Asian matrix transfers like TP times HF times P. Of course, P is an invertible matrix, so it is non-zero. So this should be the new Asian matrix, HF prime, if you want. So this implies that the rank of the Asian matrix is a finally invariant, which is very well known. So now I'm asking, what about homogeneous models in the branch when the Asian rank is identically equal to one? Little exercise. First, I want to comment about what could be called degenerate cases. So these are the degenerate case. I did not do something proper with all details in these slides. So this is the degenerate case. And I just say orally what's happening. So because the Asian rank is equal to one, this means that the matrix after some elementary affine transformation, the Asian rank, the Asian matrix, uh, the origin at least, is of this form, of course. So the one, the number one here, correspond to this quad, 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 quadric monomial here. And there are no other quadric monomial in the graph f of x, y. Next, I am looking at all the three terms, monomials, all the three monomials. What do I mean? I'm just looking at all monomials. 
So if you want me to write it down, I do. So it will be some G plus K plus L F G K L X G Y K uh, Z L with the sum this is equal to three okay I said before equal to mu you remember okay okay so now if I assume that there are no order three monomials then first proposition which I did not write this is an finally invariant condition more precisely if you make an affine transformation which stabilizes the quadratic terms. And if you assume that the cubic terms are all zero, then on the right after affine transformation, it will be the same. The cubic terms will be also zero. So the assumption that the cubic terms do not exist is a finally invariant. Next, by some process, which is like lengthy and difficult to write down, which is like you convince yourself easily on a computer, you can then show that if the surfaces are finally um, homogeneous, which by means, by this I mean that there is a homogeneity hypothesis, then you can conclude by some computation which I just dropped in this slide, that the O of four terms are equal zero. The O of five terms are all equal zero. The O of six terms are all equal zero, etc. And so this means that this hypersurface in F in C4, so this H3 is contained in C4, as I said, is in fact something I'm cheating a bit. I'm cheating a bit. It's a bit false what I'm saying. You can show that the function here depends only on X. I'm cheating a bit. So, but I want to say that the, the, the terms in Y and Z are all zero. In fact, this now is purely correct. So this means that now you show by some computation, which is like lengthy anyway, that the function is only depending on X and no Y, no Z, no Y, no Z. So it means that the hypersurface S3 is a product, is a product of a curve times C2. So this is C2 and this is a curve. So this is a degenerate case. And of course, the affine classification of such hypersurface amounts essentially to the affine classifications of curves. So we just don't look at it. We exclude this case. Next. If you assume that there is some order three term, then you can show that after some elementary normalization, the coefficient here, which I call F210, why? Because it's X power two, Y power one, Z power zero. If you want, I put Z power zero here to be very clear, okay? Then you can show that F210 is a relative invariant as a Taylor coefficient, relative invariant. So this means that if you change coordinate, this co Taylor coefficient is multiplied by non-zero quantity. So in there are two cases, either it is zero always, or it is always non-zero. And if it is non-zero, if it is zero, it is already discussed. I said, if there is no cubic term, this is what I said before. So now I must assume that this Taylor coefficient is non-zero. And then using the dilation factor in change of coordinate, I can make it equal to one. Now, once this is done, I'm looking at all the four terms. And now again, the same discussion. Suppose that all the four terms are all zero. Then first proposition, if you make any affine transformation which stabilizes the cubic terms in, up to cubic terms included, then the fact that there are no quartic terms is invariant 
under affine change of coordinates. Second proposition, if these quartic terms are absent, then you show that order five, order six, order seven, etc. terms, there is no Z present in them. And therefore, so this is again like uh, painful to do it, to write it down also is painful with details, I mean. So this means that you get something with no Z. So it's just a surface like in the dubrov komrakov raminovich classification. So as I said, I exclude this because it's a degenerate situation because you have a surface now, you have a surface times C. So the classification amounts to modulo slight adaptation. It's not straightforwardly the same. There are slight differences, but I don't want to touch it. So I forget. And therefore, I do assume that there are some order four terms, some quartic terms. They are not all zero. And again, I don't give all details. And I say proposition. After affine pre-normalizations, as I said, first, you have the cubic terms, up to cubic terms. And now I did not explain, but some quartic term can be killed easily. I make a little comment. Here, here, this term, in fact, is not very meaningful. It's quartic, but it's not meaningful because it is linked with these terms. Because as I said, I assume that the Asian is identically of rank one. So this term in, 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 in light blue is necessary to make the Asian matrix to be of constant rank one, otherwise it is false. So this quartic term is not meaningful. So I do the same on a target hypersurface. So I just do, I just write something. So you have this H, you have like affine transformation, which goes to an H, H prime. So this is an affine equivalence, okay? Which I did not uh, write uh, completely. And then by computation, you realize that F301 is also a relative invariant. More precisely, when you change coordinate, F prime 301 is a non-zero multiple, non-zero multiple of F301. If you do enter a bit the details, after group reduction, so I say that group reduction is to stabilize this normal form up to this point. You can verify that the sub group of the full GL4 group is this. And then by some easy computation, you can realize that F prime 301 is one over AK times F301 and neither A nor K are zero because the determinant of this matrix is A one K A square. It's not triangular, but you can, you can verify that the determinant is this. And it should of course be non-zero because it is a subgroup of GL4. So it is a subgroup of GL4. So it, is, it must be <laughs> non-zero. So as I said, this is non-zero and therefore this is a true relative invariant. And now if this relative invariant, but you can even show that, I did not mention it here, that this you can also always uh, uh, normalize to zero. You can always make it zero. So it does not count in fact. So now you have to create two branches. The first branch, is this term is non-zero and the second is this term is zero, but the second branch is already done because I was cheating a bit when I said uh, there are no other four terms. I was cheating a bit. This is about what I call independent jet, not full jet. Anyway, I don't want to enter this technicality. So I continue. And now I assume because I said, if F301 is zero, then this is a degenerate case. So I don't care. 
I don't care about the base generic key. Okay. And now what do I do? I do assume that it is non-zero. By using A and K, I can make it equal to one. And therefore, I get this kind of thing. So this is my starting point. So here, look the combinatorics. So here, there is S square. Here, there is X square Y. And here, there is X cube Z. And I put some factorial. Six is factorial of three. So as I said, this is just something not very useful, but necessary for the Hessian to be of rank one. And now next, what about other five terms? So again, these monomials correspond to the fact that the Hessian should be of, of rank one, so they are not very meaningful. And now you realize that this is a relative invariant. And also next, you look at all the six terms, okay? And you also realize that this is F600 and F510 are relative invariants also. And after some exploration, you realize that only the branch when F600 is equal to zero lead to a homogeneous model. And it is this one, which is a bit exotic with a closed equation. And I want to make a remark. Here you divide by this z square means that it is not analytic, it's not smooth. It seems that, to, that it is a singularity. But no, this singularity is illusory. Why? Because there is a square, this square root, you see, here. And there is one plus something. You expand in Taylor series, and you see that the z square disappears. It, it is illusory. So it's really analytic. So now there is another representation with no square root, which is perfectly equivalent. And this homologous model has one dimensional isotropy. And it is the full classification in dimension three. There is only one homologous model with Asian rank one. So after doing this, I also on the computer studied the four dimensional hypersurface in C5, okay, with Hessian rank one, or the Hessian is the Hessian of the graphing function F, HF, rank one. So it is, if I, if I do put coordinates, U equal F of X, Y, Z, and say uh, S for instance, okay? And then once again, so I did not- uh, uh, Joel, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So in your first form, U equal to the square root. Do you take two branches plus minus square root to get actually homogeneous uh, model? Uh, you're probably true, yes. I did not like uh, recover everything. You're probably true. There are two solutions. I agree. I somehow remember. Uh, so, so actually, this is this, this, uh, this polynomial form that that's the correct form to do it, right? No, not with square root, but build those. Uh, I, of course, the algebraic form is better, as you say. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, because, because like all, all complex numbers, it's not like clear which, which, which branch to take. So probably. To just yes, yes, them. because I'm I'm working locally, as I said. So, of course, it is algebraic, as as you as you say. So, uh, okay, it, yeah. working locally, I get only this. So that's what I what I say, and I got this because I use some maple procedure to integrate. But for unfortunately, for four dimensional in C five, I could not integrate with maple. And I get one model. So the theorem is that there is one model also, one single model, non-degenerate, I say, one single model. And the thing is that I have no closed form like this because it's too complicated. Maybe there is some, but I don't know. So I did not show it. Yeah, because yeah. Like, uh, like in order to uh, eliminate singularity, you really would like to consider like plus square root, right? So if you think about real. But this bottom model actually, uh, well, I probably can see just near zero, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, everything is local. I, I was not very clear about this. Oh, 
everything I'm doing is local. Okay. So yeah. if something global exists, I will capture it anyway. So, so I think you cannot put a minus. Minus is forbidden because this will not like erase this. I, yeah. I did not really look at it, I must say. I did not finish to think about what are the branches of it. But what I say is that I even don't remember how I did it at that time because this paper is not like written yet. I just want to mention, but I'm sure for this, I'm completely sure that there is a single model at the level of Taylor series. This I'm sure because this I, 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 I cannot like explain. I think after order eight, all Taylor coefficients are determined uni uniquely. I see it on computer, but it's like long. All Taylor coefficients are determined. So this means that there is a single model for sure. And it's, it is, that does not depend on parameters. But since it's a fine group, right? So you, you can actually integrate. And so, so it's probably, I mean, complete, the, the, the vector fields you get, they, they are complete, right? Normally, yes, normally, yes. This is yeah, somehow so what I actually did. Actually, global model. Yeah, this is what to say, I don't remember. I put the Lie algebra, I did not write it down in these notes. And I asked Maple to integrate and it gave, it, it gave me this. Yes, absolutely. Then like should be actually both branches uh, there, but just like one. Yeah, probably, probably, probably. No, no I, I don't think so. It's square root here as well. Uh, so it's square root is here just uh, uh, probably a formal power series or analytic power series or a single analytic, branch. Yes. Yeah, analytic. And uh, it is essential to have plus here to kill the singularity one uh, over uh, C squared. C squared. Yeah. No, I mean, as this in near the point where u equal to zero, but if you have minus and the other branch, I think if it is out including the other branch, the group will not act. Maybe. I will, I will think about it. Thank you. So I stop about this. Uh, in fact, I can continue about this. Uh, because after doing this in dimension four, I said to myself, I should do, I should go further. <laughs> so I did on computer. So I have some generalities. Maybe I will be quicker now. So I will just survey now. So you, you see now I'm in Rn. So u equal f of x1, xn, v. So this is a target. This is a target here, y1, yn. So this is a general affine transformation. These are constants, translation constants. And the determinant of this matrix should be in GL n plus one. So it should be non-vanishing determinant, okay? So affine vector fields look this way. So first line, I put the translation vector fields and this is the GL, GL n plus one vector fields. So the symmetry group is a set of affine transformations which stabilize the hypersurface. P of H is containing H modulo shrinking the neighborhood. And the Lie algebra is a set of vector fields, affine vector fields. I didn't write here affine, but it is understood. L restricted to H is tangent. So everything will be local. And of course, the hypersurface is said to be locally affinely homogeneous if the span of the tangent vector fields is a whole tangent space to the hypersurface. So you can go infinitesimally in all directions in the neighborhood of the point P0. So it's standard Lie group theory, so I admit. So I review some results uh, which go beyond the case of surface due to Dubrov and Komrakov and Rabionich, another paper, also a paper with Wood and Lejov. And also I mentioned that joint with Chen, we have wanted to have the different chain invariants. I will discuss it about it later. So now there is a little problem. And there is an assumption on this little problem. Can I determine or even attempt to determine the affinely homogeneous hypersurface Hn in Rn plus one of constant Hn rank one? Can I? So as I said, I did it, uh, I did not put a paper on archive yet. In two, three, four, I did it, like in uh, one year and a half ago. Uh, and then uh, exploring dimensions five, six, and seven, I was very surprised 
I also asked Mike Eastwood recently, and he answered me that he did not see this phenomenon before, that there are no homogeneous models except the degenerate ones, which you take a product of RM with a hypersurface. And in fact, it remembers a part of the talk of David Sykes about this in the CR setting. But there is a strong difference with the CR setting because in the works of Igor Zelenko, uh, Curtis Porter, and David Sachs, they would say that the Asian rank is equal to n minus one in their CR manifold for the Levy form. This is what they assume. But this is more difficult, I guess, than what I'm speaking about because I'm, I'm saying I'm taking the lowest possible rank because Asian rank zero means that it's just flat, it's just a hyperplane, u equals zero. This is for the Asian rank equal to, to zero. So this is trivial. So I said to myself, why not start with Asian rank equal to one? And I, I, I did something which is already on archive and it's already uh, uh, accepted for publication. And I start with a CRM, the general one, the first one. So I take my time. So it's a bit technical. So we, we, we just, I, I mentioned something. It was extremely difficult to write this paper. I could not believe it because on computer it was like uh, quicker. So let us state the first theorem. So you take a hypersurface, which is locally a finally homogeneous, and it has constant Asian rank one, as I said. So it's a, just a generalization in any dimension. Then, there exists an integer which I call NH, which is an integer intrinsic to the hypersurface, so that I can split the coordinates to x1, etc., x this special integer NH, x NH plus one, etc., to xn, so that there is a certain hypersurface, and there is also the coordinate u, I forgot, sorry. There is also the coordinate u. So that in the space of x1, xnh, and u, which is r power nh cross r power one, okay? You have a certain hypersurface, no, sorry, you have a certain hypersurface, which I call H NH, which is of dimension NH, this specific integer. And the hypersurface I started from is just a product of this hypersurface, a product with the remaining coordinates. So it's just like just a, a cylinder. So this means that these this coordinates are nothing, essentially. I would say that nothing, this is nothing just a product. And moreover, the equation of the hypersurface is the following. U, as I, as I said, U is equal to F of X1, et cetera, X NH, X NH plus one, et cetera, X N, okay? But in this form, there are no these coordinates, they do not appear. So I say absent. So in this group, I find coordinates. So the confirmation is, is this. These are the remainder of order NH plus two to infinity, and they depend only on the first NH coordinates. And also the first line. The first line, I want to comment on it. So you recognize X1 square, which is, remember, we, we had before uh, in blue, we had before X square over two plus X square Y over two, you remember this? And then there was X cube Z over six, okay? In uh, three dimensions. So this X cube uh, Z over six is the first term on this sum, it's for m equals three here. 
And in fact, there is a sum of x1 power m times xm for m equal three to nh divided by a factorial plus some quadratic terms. This is quadratic in x, y, x, g with i, g less, uh, bigger than two. So this which, which I call dependent jet and I don't want to enter on, 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 on the technique, depend on monomials, as I said already with the same color, it is about uh, something which is necessary to be sure that the Hessian is constantly of rank one. So these are something like not very meaningful, but useful anyway to prove the theorem, the main theorem below. And then uh, here, the remainder is in x2, x m minus one, when, where m is this integral m here. So I repeat, there is an intrinsic integer which tells you that in fact, after some affine transformation, your hypersurface is a function of only a certain number of coordinates and the other are not present. And of course, this theorem is general for any hypersurface of any constant Hessian rank. This is no, this I just wrote it down for constant Hessian rank one, but for general constant rank Hessian, I am not able, the thing, the, the theorem that it depends only on a certain number of coordinates can be proved for any constant rank in any dimension, but the normalization I wrote, no, I don't know how to do it. I did not really try, but I know maybe I cannot do it. I'm almost convinced I cannot do it in general, because now I strongly assume and use the fact that the Hessian is of constant rank one. So as I said, I exclude, exclude the degenerate case because it amounts to classification in smaller dimension, modulo some slight changes, Gen generate cases. Okay, so this means that from now, I assume that NH is equal to N, it's not smaller. Okay, so now what do I do? I write down this theorem for NH equal N. Okay, and not only this, look, because there was some difficulty in this, in this project. Uh, look, here I, I finish my last comment on this slide uh, in blue, or no, 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 maybe in, in uh, yes, this, this. So look, the sum goes to NH here. So this means that M is NH and X M is NH. So the order here is NH plus one. Order NH plus one. And this is normal because here I said NH plus two. Okay. So I'm able to show you the order NH plus one terms. But if NH now is assumed to be equal to N, then it will be N plus one. But it's not enough. That's the problem, it's not enough. You have to go further. This is a second theorem. So of course I do not, so in the paper, it's like, it's like 50 pages of details. So I don't give all details today, it's impossible. But now I write down the CRM for NH equal N up to order N plus one excluded. And now I state the CRM. Uh, no, sorry, it's the next theorem. Sorry, no, 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 no. I go to other n plus three first. So I said previous theorem is n plus one. Now it's up to n plus three. So again, constantation rank one as before. Okay. And assume it is not a finally equivalent to a product of Rm with a certain hypersurface in smaller dimension. So this means once again, then NH is equal to N. Then in the introduction of the paper, I could write down the terms up to order N plus three included, included. So it's less than N plus three. So it, now it's a bit more subtle because now remember you had this kind of terms, okay? But at this place, you have al already used a lot of the affine group. So it remains not so much freedom to normalize in order n plus two, so this is these lines, as this is order n plus two, you can still use some freedom to normalize some Taylor coefficient. And then uh, this Taylor coefficient 
becomes a relative invariant. You show it. I, I showed it in, in general dimension in the paper. And next, you go to order n plus three. Okay, so this is n plus three here, these two lines. So maybe I should erase this. And then uh, now you don't uh, normalize so much because you have like used a lot of the affine group. There is only one Taylor coefficient which you have normalized as far as I remember. It is the F, there is plus zero here. And the zero here is the Taylor coefficient F n plus two, zero, one, zero, etc. zero. So this you can make zero. And once you have reached this, so I show it in some specific situation in just a while, the isotropy group, so the group production, the, 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 the G-stab, what I call the G-stab, which means the, the group, the subgroup of the affine groups that I get is only one dimension. It is the, the G-stab at order N plus three, let us call it this one, is one dimensional. And it's just written below. So I don't write it now. It's even written here, sorry. It's written here. Okay, sorry. It's written here. So there is only one, one constant, which is three. So it's, it's a matrix, which I write below, which is like C, zero, one over C, one over C square, etc., and zero elsewhere, which is contained in GL L plus one, GL of N plus one. So now you are just reaching the limit and uh, there is no much possibility to normalize because there is only one parameter C to normalize. And uh, I should have done this before, but now I look at what it is really in small dimensions. In dimension two, it is this. So this is what I said, F40, F31, this is a G3 stub. And then you can show with details how you can, for instance, normalize this F40, okay? Because here you have the B2, B2 here, which is a free constant in the subgroup of GL3, GL of 3R. And then you can use this constant to normalize, to kill, in fact, to kill this, and then next to kill this, okay? But now, as I said, so this is now an illustration of what I said before. Then now you say that this Taylor coefficient G31 is just a multiple of F31, so it is a relative invariant. You see it on computer easily. Now in dimension three, so here are somehow the details. So again, there is X, as I said at one moment, is X square over two, X square Y over two, X cube Z over six, okay? Plus the dependent monomials, and then you can show similarly that you can normalize some more Taylor coefficients. For instance, you can use B2, which is here, B3, sorry, B3, which is still free. So everything is red. In red is dependent. Red equal uh, used already. It's already used, okay? What is in black? Black is, can be used to normalize. Can be used to normalize. Can be used to normalize Taylor coefficient to normalize, okay? So I use B3 and then also similarly, I can use a two one here, which is still free here to normalize, for instance, this G, G401 as I said before. So here I normalize this one, this one, and then everything disappears, everything disappears. So this coefficient disappears, this coefficient uh, F401 disappears, and then this remains a relative invariant. So this is in dimension three, because as I said, <coughs> there are only two terms here, and there are, we, you can see that G410 is a non-zero multiple of F410 because of course, A11 is non-zero. It is essentially on the diagonal. It's a di the diagonal, so it is non-zero. Okay, go, go. Now in dimension four, or dimension four, you have similar things. So once again, this thing, this kind of thing are dependent monomials, okay? So you recognize here, you recognize the sum, as I said, X1 power M, XM, okay? Divided by M factorial. 
So here in this uh, slide, it for m equal two to four, okay? And then you look at other n plus two terms, not n plus ones. Here, here is n plus one. Here is n plus two. And again, you do it. You look at what you can normalize, and it's similar. So I draw in dimension five. I wrote down also in the paper in dimension six also. And now in dimension six, you have more things you can normalize, but the, the combinatorics is the same. But now comes, starts the trouble. How can you pro, you write this down in general dimension? How? Huh. You have to dominate the combinatorics. That's not easy. So I took, it took me quite a bit of time to write down the paper. And I will skip presenting this very uh, technical part. But there is a key aspect, which I will speak later in these Greek lectures which is to always infinitesimalize the action on a certain order, like Lee in his complete works did, to slightly simplify the computations. Now, I cite the real CRM, not just the preliminary one, but now I realize that I spoke already in one hour, close to one hour, so I should like stop soon, isn't it? Uh, um, I mean, it's up to you. We can go a little bit uh, further, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, it's up to you. Yes, maybe I should stop with this in uh, like in less than 15 minutes. I, I, I wanted to speak about exceptional Lie algebras and CR geometry. Maybe I will devote five minutes on this uh, uh, at the very end. So this is a CRM sure. which gives you the normal form up to order n plus n plus five, so this is n plus five, and it's it's a big deal to write this completely uh, to to verify that proofs are correct. Of course, uh, all what I've wrote here is the same in dimensions two, three, four, five, six, seven, because I have five on maple, which gives the same formulas as I somehow showed just a part before, not everything up to the n plus five. And then I check that the formula that I write is exactly the same that I obtain independently on Maple Five. So I have good, 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 uh, good hope that there is no mistake. And now I start with the same main CRM, which was a bit unexpected to me. In any dimension n, at least five, there are no. A finally homogeneous constant ration on rank one and non degenerate, which means non product. I say non product hypersurfaces. So this means, that I, I, as I said, that the, the specific integer NA should be equal to N. That's, that's the theorem. So just a few words about how the proof goes. Oh, Okay, enregistré. It's not once you got this when you when you are once you are able to normalize up to the n plus plus five. Uh, so what's happening to me? I try. Uh, I have no control. I have no control now. So what? Okay, I have no control. What, what's the problem? So now, okay, okay, now I have control. Okay, continue, record. Okay, so what? Now I have to share screen. Okay, uh, desktop do. Okay, desktop. Okay, good, good, good. So now you have control. So now I have this, this normal form. I take uh, infinitesimal symmetry. It is easy to show that uh, transversal T0 should be zero. Okay. And this constant, no, sorry, 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 not these ones, sorry. This constant, this translational constant should be free in the computations so that you have n dimensional freedom to have local transitivity. And then what? So you apply this vector field to this normal form. 
as I said, L to minus U plus F, you restrict. You look at what I call the independent jet. So this means that this, what I call in, in, in light blue, should not look at it because they are just dependent jets. They, are, they, are, they, they bring no more information. So you write it down, it's, it's a pain. And then what you, what, 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 you, what you do is to you examine. So you should have something which is identically zero. As I said, this L of minus U plus F should be identically zero, okay? So I, I look at all Taylor coefficients. So this means it gives me a bunch of equations. And especially you compute two equations only among, um, among them. I'm cheating a bit because you have to take account of everything was done up to order n plus five, in fact. Anyway, and you, you get two equations of the following kind, one and two, which are of the following kind. So one is something times T1, something times T2, a specific rational coefficient times T4, plus something times A11. So isotropy is 1D, one dimensional. So it is one dimensional and it's, it's, it's a coefficient A11, okay? So this coefficient, for instance, if this, this Taylor coefficient would be non-zero, this means that you can solve this A11, okay? But it must be non-zero because otherwise, if it is non-zero, so this means that this term drops, if it is zero, this term drops, and you have a non-zero linear dependence relation between T1, T2, T4, which as I said, should be absolutely free because you have for transitivities, it should be absolutely free. Otherwise it is not transitive. And therefore it must be non-zero. But then if it is non-zero, this means that you can solve A11 and then you, you replace A11, A11 it is equal to something times T1 plus something times T2 plus something times T4, okay? And you replace here in this equation. And because there is this coefficient in T5, which is not mixed with T1, T1, T2, T4, they mixed with this. But this one do not, does not mix, does not mix. Then there is a non-zero Taylor coefficient and then equation two becomes contradictory to transitivity. So this is the argument and it's finished for that. I can just make little comment. The theorem is that in any dimension N, in fact, so it is bigger than two in fact, the dimension of the affine symmetry, affine symmetry algebra is always less than four. You can deduce from what I've wrote, but I did not write down all details on the paper. So now perhaps in five minutes, I want to speak just a bit because the theme, the, the theme, sorry. So this, I want to speak later, not just one, one comment is to say that, as I said that I'm, I, I'm as, as, as uh, uh, Michael uh, spoke, so this, you, you deal with Taylor series or the Taylor, Taylor coefficients, which are here. In fact, they correspond to differential invariance. And if you really do compute in terms of original Taylor series, this gives you something very complicated. But I don't want to speak about this now. So I, I, I just, uh, I just like, uh, forget about this. And now, how should I proceed? I also wanted, ah, no, but then I will do this now. I think it's more reasonable to do something very elementary to, to close this, uh, this, this lecture. Because next time I will be really able to speak about exceptional uh, CR manifolds. So now I'm looking at something very close to surfaces in R4. So now I'm in C2. And remember, I was starting with really part of W is equal to ZZ bar, which is X squared plus Y squared. 
So now I'm looking at CR manifold. So it's something absolutely basic what I'm saying now. So you have one parameter families of bilomorphisms. You differentiate, you have Lie algebras with holomorphic Taylor coefficient. This is holomorphic, this is holo. Okay. And now I want to say, so there are some, uh, some, so, some possibility to graph, to make a graph. So U is a real part of W. V is the imaginary part of W, okay? And I'm looking at the model quadric, which is very well known, and I want to, to show how you determine the least symmetries of it. So once again, the flow of the vector field stabilizes the hypersurface. If only if L plus L bar is, is tangent. So there is a mistake here, it should be M3. I'm sorry, I made, I made a copy pass, so there is a mistake. This is a three-dimensional CR manifold here, okay? So L plus L bar, it just you conjugate Z becomes Z bar, etc. Okay. You know that Carton classified all homo homogeneous models. It was redone by Pavel Nirovsky and Tafel. The first paper of Pavel, by the way. So the flat model, instead, I prefer to put a two here. It should be, it should be U equal to uh, I say u equals z bar, okay? But I, I, I prefer to put two u here so that I get w plus w bar, which is more elementary. Uh, there is a little less complexity. So now I assign weight. Once again, it's because when I multiply z par lambda, lambda, there will be lambda square here. And then it should be lambda square here. So this is why the weight of w is two and the weight of z is equal to one. So this is absolutely general. So this is what I, I was supposed to present in full generality today, but it will be next lecture because there is a way, you, you know that there is Tanaka decomposition of certain Lie algebras, G minus one, et cetera. And so for some, some, some exceptional CR manifolds, you have a way to know in advance what are the grades of this Tanaka, suppose that it is of depth two, for instance, uh, with these weights, you capture in advance what is this part, what is this part, what is this part without mixing in the computation, which is very natural. So now to be tangent, you, ask, you, you, you make the vector field uh, apply to the equation act as a derivation, and then uh, you restrict. This gives you this, but now, as I said, you have to replace W by minus W bar plus ZZ bar. So W here should be replaced. W should be replaced here. This gives you this, okay? This gives you this, gives you this okay? And now you expand in Taylor series. And what you say, as, as, as before, there is a weight here. And now be, be, be careful, there is I plus G, and there is a two here, two because the, the weight of W is two here. The weight of W is equal to two here. So this W bar K counts twice. And then I say that this is to be computed. So the file I showed you with like 58,000 unknowns, it's about a very similar problem. I will show just in the last minute because I will restart next lecture. I'm, I'm doing is a very basic case of a sphere in uh, either the sphere in C2 because it's just the, 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 the beginning of the series, uh, like the baby of the story. And now you, you, you look at this equation weight by weight. So it means that here you have Z bar, which is a factor, so it is of weight one. So if, if I take weight mu of this equation, it is that I should wait, take weight mu minus one in A here because there is plus one here, here, okay? So there is a weight shift. So this means that if you take B of weight mu, the A, which is, remember, it's A dz plus B dw. So there is a weight shift. So there is minus one here because of this Taylor, this coefficient Z bar here. This is also the conjugate here. 
So this is very basic and well known since like more than one century, I guess, even it was known to Lee. You write down weight by weight. Explicitly, you get this. You write down the unknown. Now there are not a finite number of unknown because it's holomorphic, it's a Taylor series. It's not affine. It's more complicated in a sense. So now I go to Maple and I, I, I write down the L, the, I write down the equation that I wrote, equi e e e L. This gives me this, okay? I take weight by weight. So this is mu equal zero, mu equal one, mu equal two, et cetera. And it's a polynomial in Z, Z bar, W bar. And then all Taylor coefficients should vanish. So it gives me a linear system. And what is very interesting is that I know in advance that in the Tanaka, uh, uh, in the Tanaka grading of this Lie algebra, this will be G minus two. This will be G minus one. This will be G zero. I know this in advance because if I look at weights, I know what, what is the homogeneity. It's immediate in a sense. I do solve these equations at order zero, at order one, at order two, at order three, at order four. You have also to show that there are no Tanaka G3. So for instance, I can say, no, sorry. This is a proof that for this Lie algebra, G3 is equal to zero. And then you know very well that G4, G5, G6, etc., are all zero. After resolution, the vector field is this. There are eight generators. It is well known that it is SU to one. And this is uh, with these generators, the Lie algebra structure. So now I can somehow finish my lecture of today and I make an interlude. So today, what did I do? I, give, I gave some geometric models and I say, give me a model. I know how to find a symmetry. It's very simple. You take a vector field, tangent to the manifold, analyze the equation, solve them, and get all the, the, the symmetries. This is basic. This is just like primitive. Not completely. Not completely because just before I spend one or two minutes to, to speak about what will be coming next lecture, not completely, but it's more interesting to find all homogeneous models with the method. And I claim that with this method, with this primitive method with vector fields, you can do it. And you can do it very efficiently. And this is what somehow several times said Mikhail Zitomirsky, and I fully agree with him. And the computations are much less demanding than with Cartan's equivalence method. But I come back to, in one or two minutes, to what I said, this, give me a, a, a model, I will give you the generator seems to be easy to do, but it is not. So this I will speak later. I just give you something. So next time. So this is about exceptional Lie algebras, which are realizable as, as, as CR manifolds. This will be about next lecture. These are the structure constants of E6. So you have, you have several real versions of the complex E6. And the second version in the Satake diagram, which we, we borrowed from the book of Schapp and Slovak is this. From this, a collaborator of Pavel called Jao Nie from Utah State University was able to, to, to give me some CR manifold like this, okay? So now it's a bit more complicated because you have like in C16, it's already 16 variables times two because it's even R32. So to find the tangent, the tangent L is non-trivial, becomes non-trivial. So it's one hour, one hour, with this, uh, so Pavel came to Paris for one week and we discussed about this. So he showed me that on his computer, it was one hour of computation using uh, Jan Anderson's programs. So what he does, he transfers this to an exterior differential system, okay? So like uh, DZ uh, equals something. This is written just a bit above. 
Okay, we, we see something exactly this. So you see it. This this ex, it just it's just a simple computation, and then there is a procedure to say what are the symmetries of this exterior differential system, and it's one hour of computation. The problem is that it's not easy to devise a combinatorix, and now I can finish with this just in thirty seconds. Now I, I stop sharing the screen. And I go to Maple. No, just one moment. No, stop share. I said, okay. I share another screen, which is the first screen. Okay. Which I want to share this. Now I should launch Maple. And I have a special command for this. Yes, it's here. Okay. And I will show you that this computation for this uh, model is uh, rather quicker than one hour with my programs. Okay, go. It's a bit slow. This is an old computer. I'm sorry. So I, I just write down the eight equation I showed you, and I ask with the program to compute the symmetries. For instance, for G1 or G2. Okay. Maple. Exceptional. See Maple. E2 final. Let us go to G1, the G1 of Tanaka, for instance. Or if you prefer G2, because it's a bit, bit more complicated. And it should be this. Okay. It should be this. Okay. Okay. So now. I have my vector field L, so it's, and if you can view, these are the eight equations I showed you with some specific notations, etc. And now what it is, I, I cannot do it by hand, by the way. So how many uh, unknowns? You have 800 unknowns and 6,775 equations to solve of the kind I showed you. And now I ask Maple, Will you be slow or quick or quicker than one hour to solve the system? So now look, I return, return. It, it was done in two seconds, look, three seconds, 3.39, everything. Once this is passed, this is essentially finished. Okay. So in this setting, I have five free variables and then I get the, 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 the symmetry. Okay, voilà. I have five symmetries. And then uh, I do it for G1 also, for G0, which is quicker. And I will show you next time how to do this for other families, which is like more, more demanding than this direct uh, competition. So I think I have finished for today. Thank you very much. Questions uh, from Joel? Maybe I, I can ask a question. Uh, thanks, thanks for the talk, Sean. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to uh, one of the initial results that you had about, um, I think it was in dimension two, so that the, uh, the only homogeneous model is, has one dimensional isotropy. So, uh, and then you said for n greater than equal to five, you don't have any homogeneous models. Um, I, if you could just remind me, or maybe you might have stated it for so for for three and n is equal to three and four. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have uh, do you have any um, uh, simply transitive models at all, or do you have a complete classification in, in those cases? Yes, I have a complete classification, as unexpectedly there are only multiple multiple, multiple transitive ones. Even in there's, uh, there's no simply transitive ones. Okay. No, even in dimension two. In fact, in dimension two, I, yeah. I did not prepare this. It is simpler. Uh, in dimension two, for it's Hessian Rank One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's only Hessian Rank One. As far as I remember, I have some notes about this, but uh, but I guess the like the computations involved with uh, like for, for for n greater than equal to five, you had a nice argument, uh, which which killed the uh, the the existence of um, of having homogeneous models. I, so I was able to follow that. That, that was very nice. Um, but so 
you know, dealing with simply transitive cases, as, as you know, the, this paper that we wrote uh, for the CR case, I mean, it's quite involved generally. Um, so, but in, in this case, in the, in the n is equal to two case, is there um, is there a short argument to be able to eliminate the simply transitive cases, or is it quite an involved case by case analysis um, to be able to analyze to, to be able to kill that um, that possibility? I'm thinking. Uh, I don't remember. The problem is that I don't remember. I did it very intensively one year and a half ago, and I don't remember the details. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I even even never wrote a paper on LaTeX with this. I have various files on Maple, but I have personal notes also. But I. That's okay. I don't okay. Remember. I was just curious about the complexity. Uh, I mean, it's striking that, that that no simply. You have to model. write the paper for dimension two, three, four. Because I don't remember the details, I'm sorry. Okay. I wrote only N at least five papers. Uh, I, I decided to, to to start with this paper because it was like rather unexpected. But I agree with it's you. That it would be nice to have some like direct argument. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that for N uh, big larger than five, you can avoid. It was discussed by Igor at some point. I mm -hmm. remember in his paper he says that sometimes it's not necessary to assume that the, the the geometry is constant completely constant to have some bound on the dimension you have to reach some level of normalization mm -hmm. for which this will like make constraint on the number of symmetries and maybe yeah. it will be applied to non totally constant geometry cases mm. and the same phenomenon holds also here for instance what i said if you co come back to to this, uh, to the general theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, if I if I if I do perturb a bit the terms, I will. If I do perturb a bit these terms here, mm -hmm. for instance, then the constant Hessian rank one will will drop. I will kill the oh. assumption of constant okay. Hessian rank one. Right. But right. the theorem right. that there are no modulus model will be still true. Mm -hmm. So this is an open condition. I, I start with in the branch concentration rank one, but somehow for some reason, which is like well known, uh, it is a bit more general, but it's not very interesting. It's not, I think, very meaningful or interesting to state that. I think. Okay. Okay. can you please, uh, as Boris uh, here, mm -hmm. so can you please, um, uh, Confirm once again. So you said the dimension of the symmetry algebra is at most four. I was thinking that in dimension four, this would mean that you have simply transitive model, actually. Yes, you are right. I, I was not, uh, so I could have answered <laughs> Dennis that indeed it is true. Of course, in dimension, I didn't write the paper yet. So, but for some reason, I said to myself, will I write this paper? I don't know. But of course, I found a simply transitive one. Absolutely. Now I remember. I have some notes uh, just close to me. But it's so for like four, it's part. simply transitive, and for two and three, it's multiple, right? Right. And it's always four dimensional. That's what I remember. Yes. Yeah. It's always four dimensional. For Asian rank one, I also, I think, no, I touched surface in C4, as I said. And then in this case, also, you have a question about Asian, but I don't remember the branchings. Oh, again, there is no, no LaTeX paper, so I, I have no good memory. Um, just one, 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 one minute. Maybe one, one last question for me, if possible. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, it looks like this rank one um, cases sh should be somehow related to the geometry of curves, because like in particular oh, in, in, yes, in, in C3, uh, like um, the ancient Hessian parabolic case means, except for, well, apart from cones and um, uh, cylinders, the only other class is, uh, is all surfaces, or actually developables. So, hmm. uh, and, and the equations you show look like you, you really have some kind of a curve in the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, 
if it is true, then uh, um, we, 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 we get an immediate bound on the, symmetry, on the dimension of the symmetry because we know that the most symmetric curves would be something like rational normal curves and they have uh, uh, a bound of dimension exactly equal to four. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you've seen some relationship even in the small dimensions like three, four uh, of your Probably models is right, uh, uh, rational normal curves or like maybe they're just um, uh, tangential tang tangential surfaces generated by this. Uh, you're probably there is a way to, to, uh, to understand the problem this way. I'm convinced you're right, but I did not. Ah, okay. That, that would be very interesting to explore in detail. Mm -hmm. It should be maybe more, uh, if, you, if you are able to find such kind of quicker argument, I would be very happy, of course. Yeah, well, some kind of Lejeune trans transforms that turns your mm -hmm. rank one questions into just curves. That, uh -huh. that, mm -hmm, but I know it works in, in C3, but uh, I have no idea whether it works in higher dimensions. Uh, what I must say is that even if you, you have some geometric uh, view on it, it, I would convince that there is some complexity anyway behind because uh, when I normalize uh, the graphing function, I need really to go to other n plus five to, to, to see a contradiction in the tangency equations. Uh, you need really to have like go rather deep in the, mm -hmm. the normalization. Otherwise, you don't see the contradiction. On the n class four, there is no contradiction. You can still hope there are some homogeneous models mm -hmm. in any dimension. Yes. Well, as far as I remember, it's geometry of curves. You also have to go quite far because you, you have to take uh, quite uh, many cool. derivatives just because you, you, you construct a, a, a tangential flag. Ah, I see, I see, okay. But so it's it's similar. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But why why do you think you you will have curves? It's 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 like a rank n minus one. So you have actually sub manifolds of dimension n minus one, and so you yeah. yeah but if you take a curve and then you take um, all uh, 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 oscillating subspaces of uh, dimension. N minus two and the union of all of them, you get exactly the hypersurface of dimension N minus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a feeling that it will have, it will be exactly of rank one. At least I see, I mean, you, you, you take union of all the suspulation to get. Yeah, yeah, of right dimension, yes. It means, uh, as far as I understand, it means that instead of graphing the, the hypersurface, you, you, you parameterize it as osculating tangential. So, yep. yes. Okay, Joel, maybe just a, a small a follow up question. Um, do, do you know what the symmetry that you said this thing is four dimensional symmetry algebra? Uh, do you know what that is abstractly? Uh, I think it's elementary. I did not touch it, but uh, do you have the symmetry generators uh, on, on these slides? I have the generators, but it's, uh, I think it's uh, like, uh, like one hour. I did not do it because I was just more interested in like my main interest. I did not really touch it yet. Uh, was to speak about uh, equivalence method mm -hmm. because behind all of what I said, I, I have other things, in, especially in CF geometry, which I want to present next lecture. It's like mm -hmm. this tangential vector, vector field. As you know, I, I, I discussed much with Pavel and also myself, I started to write with Carton's method. But the problem is that we encounter a high complexity. And also when you, when you when you want to go beyond other four, for instance, for non-degenerate CR manifolds, the computation be become undoable, essentially. So my main- You're talking about Carton's moving frame method, in a sense. Yes, Carton's equivalence method, yes. Okay. Because you construct a G structure, you reduce the G, G structure, and then because you work with functions, the computations are extremely difficult to handle, especially for CR manifolds because Contrary to ODEs or PDEs, you have two more derivations. So the differential expression explodes really. So I completely agree with you, uh, Denis and also Boris, that uh, more, more understanding about these structures is very, very uh, precious. 
but as, as, as I can answer is that for four dimensional linear algebras, there are classifications which are elementary. I think it's very easy to find, but I was not working in that direction really. My main interest was to understand better an alternative method of equivalence, alternative to Cartan's equivalence method, which I did not present at all today, just a bit. And when we, we made this joint paper about five dimensions on CR manifold, I did not understand it at all at that time. What I did, I did understand at the time is give, you, give me a model, then I can find the generators with like cheap calculations. And now I say, I understood since our collaboration that essentially as Mikhail was lecturing, that with the same method, you can get everything, not only a given model, but the classification. So there is an algorithm that I try to present next, next lecture. And essentially I presented a bit of the algorithm because I said that you have to make a branching whether this is non-zero or it is zero, this relative invariant for instance here. And the interest is that the method works only at the origin. Cartan's approach is bundle approach. It, it, it wants really to have normalization at, at every point. And when you construct a new structure or in affine geometry, we, we, you construct an invariant frame or core frame, you work at every point. And there is a price to pay in computation for that, a very high price. And the thing is that I understood only one year ago, goes back to the same kind of thinking of Poincaré and Mikhail Zitomirsky, is to say that uh, these Taylor coefficients, which seems to be very naive, they are differential invariants at every point. They are not just uh, uh, constants. They are functions. And I tried to explain this later. Why? Because uh, it's, it's, it's below. I showed you quite quickly something which I did not discuss. It's below here. Look, it's a paper with chain. So here we say we start with a, just a surface in C3, something basic. You assume that the rank of the equation is two. And we, we make several affine normalizations up to order three. And what I am doing with you today is I, 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 I do not want to know how this GGK depend on the original Taylor coefficient. I don't want to look at it anymore, which I did during 10 years. I did this during 10 years of my life. And with, because Cartan's method pushes you to do that. That's a problem. It really uh, pushes you to do that. Not necessarily. Not completely, I agree, not completely. If you it depends if you, if you push it parametrically, uh, you push Cartan's method parametrically or not. Right. Yeah, um, I, I was speaking about parametric Cartan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you but, yeah, I, I completely agree that you get, a, you know, expression blow up. <laughs> you try yes. to do everything in terms of so the original Even for this G, there is something with 36 terms and we played with this. Yeah. And the key yeah. point, which I did not tell you today, is that mm -hmm. if you are in a branch, when some differential invariant vanishes identically, like Asian rank two instead of three, mm -hmm. or even in the branch, when this is identically zero, until November 2020, I was totally not able to express the consequences of this van is vanishing. This is why I thought it was absolutely necessary to compute this. But in November 2020, I was able to find the consequences in a branch when a differential invariant vanishes just at the level of Taylor coefficient without knowing the function. And this was the key, I think, the key point I tried to explain next time. Because as, 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 as we know, uh, Denis, uh, uh, as we both know, in these CR manifolds, which are non-degenerate, we do not completely understand the branching tree after order four. You, you've done with Boris and uh, Medvedev uh, absolutely uh, terrific impressive papers, two papers, which I was extremely impressed because they were able to finish the classification. But something is still a bit unknown. It's a branching tree in order five, six, seven, because this is to be discussed about whether a differential invariant vanishes or not. 
And this is I, this I want to, to work on it, but I not enough time. So I have a PhD student, Julia Ed, who is looking at fiber preserving uh, five dimensional PDEs as you've done with uh, Boris Dubrov and Alexander Medvedev. And we encounter something that we'll present next time is that we have an action of GL2 on eight dimensional. So in Carton's case, it's five dimensional, it's projective. So in your papers, you say that there is a carton quartic uh, invariant in the carton bundle. So there is an action of GL2 on it. Uh, and you discuss betwe between the root, the root of the quartic. And we have a similar phenomenon, but not with a quartic. It is a quartic, but with more variables. It's eight instead of five variables. You're working in, in uh, five dimensional also in five dimensional, but not the, I, full I group, yeah. not the full group of transformation, the, the fiber preserving ones. Oh, I see, I see, uh, fiber preserving, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, it's a bit different, okay. there are more okay. models, I think, a bit more models, yes. Okay, yeah, look forward to But of that. course, it's difficult, because what you've done is, is, is very impressive. Uh, I told you several times. <laughs> Thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thank you. <laughs> Any uh, other question? Uh, I have a quick question. Just um, to clarify with the the rank rank one Hessian mm -hmm. structures, did um, did you find these are locally locally unique or or they're 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 not in each n equals two three and four? Yes, and two three four. Uh, it's I have the models, but I did not write. They are they, they do not depend on parameters. Yes. They are just oh, okay. There are no parameters. It's so not I, so rich. I have also a remark about the earlier question with their symmetries. Um, such structures have been described in the, the fels kalb classification of homogeneous um, five-dimensional yes, yes. manifolds, and their symmetry algebras have a, a nice description. Um, this four-dimensional algebra is given as a representation of GL2 on homogeneous polynomials. So this would be a, a reference for, for yeah. No, no, I know I cite regularly first scope, but I don't proceed like they do because they, they do not, as, as you said, they look at abstract algebra structures and they play with this yes. only. Yeah. And me, I prefer to play with equivalence method. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so I, I discussed several times with Pavel about that. The interest, yeah. so there are some drawbacks in two approaches. In every approach, it's not every approach has drawbacks. Um, for, for Pavel and for me, the, the, the interest of uh, equivalence method is that in advance, it will be splitting in non equivalent classes. But as we said, after some time, computations become unfeasible. So you have to accept to mix with other approaches. But then you're not sure that the models are like uh, disjoint. They are not equivalent. And you have by some extra uh, uh, arguments to verify uh, that the classification does, has no overlap. But the interest of Carton's method or the power series method of equivalence of Poincaré and Moser is that you really distinguish from the beginning different branches and you know in advance there will be absolutely no overlap when you create the branches. And as mm -hmm. we said, for for in the case of uh, of uh, Felskarp, uh, they were able to show by pure algebraic methods that it's always a tube. And then they go back to to product of a surface degenerate Hessian Rancourt in R three, and then by some extra arguments, which are not trivial, they show that they're not biomorphically equivalent. But we made a little paper with Pavel with no details in which we really apply the method of equivalence. We get the same results, of course, and we are sure that they are disjoint. So it's, it's really, a, and, and the tree is very simple. There are only two branches. It's very elementary. Also in the Felskow paper, they, they remark they were that they were not able to find examples of these um, rank one Hessian structures above n equals four. 
Um, so it's, it's oh, yeah, 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 nice. Yeah, I remember this question. You're, you're, you're true, absolutely. Yeah, but I, yeah. I have, of course. I and so your me. result explains why they they were not able to. It's it's nice. No, no, no. What I get, give an example. Above. Um, I don't know. In the in the question is S and rank two. No, no, sorry. S and rank two. Sorry. You, what the what they wanted oh. is S and rank two. You you're true. I also tried at that time, but also uh, Igor, in one of his papers, says it's not difficult to show that they, they do not exist. And I agree, it's not difficult to show. But for S and rank one, they did not raise the question in their paper. Or right, there, there, it's a very small part of the paper in the example section where they describe K non-degenerate structures in um, of CR dimension K, uh, which falls into this, yeah, yeah. this category. I know this section. Oh, yes. oh, okay. But okay. First, so, in, a, in a later paper, we were able to find examples in, in high dimensions. He has a paper first, which is not much cited about that. Okay, maybe if there are no other questions. So let's uh, thank Joel again. Thank you very much.